my great privilege and pleasure to start this uh, service off with something that if we did it every Sunday, it wouldn't be enough, and that's to baptize a new believer in Jesus Christ. We have two today. We're going to have several next week uh, as well, maybe four or five next week, but we have two today. You pray for them. Uh, baptism is something we are commanded to do after we have trusted Christ as our Lord and Savior. That's why we call it believer's baptism. Uh, it is a believer. Uh, it, it is symbolic of the death of the old person, the old creature, and the resurrection of the new creature in Jesus Christ. So baptism is very important for your early Christian life especially. We have two that have recently made decisions for Christ. Would you pray for them? Well, it's good to see you this morning. If you're visiting with us, we're so glad you're here. Let's all stand together as we sing. Let's just praise the Lord. Sing with me. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's just lift our hearts toward heaven and praise the Lord. Let's just praise.
broken we do. do do you feel the shadows deepen we, we do. do but do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through we do do you wish that we could all that we made new we do is all creation groaning it is is a new creation coming it is is the glory of the lord to be the light within our midst it is it is good that we remind ourselves of this it is is anyone worthy is anyone whole is anyone able to break the seal and open the scroll the Lion of Judah, who conquered the grave. He is David's root and the Lamb who died to ransom the slave. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy? Every people and tribe, every nation and town, he has made us a kingdom and priest to God to reign with the Son. Is he worthy? Is he worthy of all blessing and honor and glory? Is he worthy?
your Bibles, you can still go to Luke chapter 7, Luke chapter 7. Over the last year or so, we've spent a number of times when I've, I've been able to preach talking about hurting and talking about pain and uh, talking about the struggles that, that we have faced. And today I'm excited to talk about something along the lines but something that um, maybe we don't talk about, a type of hurt that we don't talk about very often because if you hurt this way, you might not be as spiritual as you want people to think you are. Uh, this is a pain that, that I have, have dealt with many times over the years uh, and I still struggle with from time to time if I'm being totally honest with you. We've been going through a series on plot twists and different plot twists that are in the Bible and looking at the different plot twists that you find, and a plot twist being something when just something just all of a sudden changes courses, right? When all of a sudden the unexpected happens, and you thought you were going one way, and now you're going a different direction, and you never saw it coming. And today I want to talk about this idea of forgiveness undeserved, love unexpressed. And that might sound a little strange to you, to think of, uh, of that, we get forgiveness undeserved, but what are, what are we talking about when we say love unexpressed? And we'll, we'll dive into that shortly. This hurt that the world, there, there are people all across the world today who are hurting. It's a specific hurt. It's the feeling of unworthiness. A feeling of never being good enough. A, a nagging voice that says, you don't deserve forgiveness. It's that, that voice in the back of your head that maybe says, you don't even have forgiveness. You think you do, or maybe you thought you did, but now you have crossed a line and you, you ain't, you, he ain't going to forgive you now. And there are friends, maybe they're not here today, maybe you're not going through that, but I am sure you have friends around you who have had statements, made statements like that. I just, I just think I'm too far gone. You know, that, that church thing, that sounds good for some people, that works for some people, but I think I'm just too far gone for something like that. I, it, it just wouldn't work for somebody like me. My dad, in part of his testimony, he shares and he says, you know, Jake, I was scared to go to church. I was raised during an era, during a time when, when you had, even though we could go to the bar, we could go wherever we wanted and, and do whatever we wanted, but at the same time, we still had a respect and a reverence for God. We had a reverence for the Bible, and we had a reverence for preachers. And uh, he said, that's just the way I was raised. I didn't have any, I didn't apply anything they said. <laughs> I didn't live it out at all, but I was at least a little bit nervous about them. I didn't want to cross them. And, uh, and he said, but uh, he said, when I was invited to go to church, before I got saved, I was very much afraid that when I walked through the doors, the whole roof was going to cave in. And matter of fact, he said at the end of the service, the preacher, it was a revival service, the preacher is preaching, and he finished up and he said, you know, I've, I've never done this before, or maybe I, I've only done this once before. And he took his Bible folded up his Bible at the very end of the service. He said, some of you have been here. My dad had been to, I think it was the second or third service of this revival that he had been to, just coming consecutively. And uh, he raised his hand and he had acknowledged that he was not a believer, that he was not a follower of Christ. And the preacher said, well, if those of you that raise your hand, if you will, come forward and, and I'd like to share with you how to be saved. And my dad never moved. And he said on that last service, the preacher took his Bible and went, had the ushers go, and I don't think you're allowed to do this anymore, but lock the side doors of the church. <laughs> he 
stood at guard at the side of the church, and the preacher stuck his Bible down at the, the one exit that was available. And he said, you can leave here today, but when you leave, you step over the Word of God. You walk out those doors, knowing you're in sin, you have taken your life into your own hands. You walk out those doors, you step over the Word of God, and you know you've got sin in your life. You acknowledge that, and you walk out those doors. It's like spitting in the face of God. He left that Bible there, and Dad said, they might as well put a giant rattlesnake back there. I, w I was either going to camp out that night, or I was getting saved. One of the two. <laughs> And he said, I went down to the altar and I accepted Christ as my Savior. He said, the next day I got up and uh, the experience that I had was like none other. I, I had never sensed this before. He said, I went down, when I went down to the altar, it wasn't some crazy prayer. It wasn't some uh, amazing uh, theological thing that I went through. He said, I basically just said, God, I don't even know if you're there. I don't even know if you're real. But if you are, my life is a wreck. If you are there, I need you. Amen. And that, that night, he accepted Christ as his Savior. He said, the next day when I got up, I walked outside. And he said, for the first time that I could remember, I heard the birds singing. <laughs> he, said, he said, I heard the birds singing. And it caught my attention. He said, I looked around and I saw creation. And I thought to myself, God is here. I looked around and I saw all the things, and, and, and then I thought about my life and how God had been involved in my life. And it amazed me. We sing about this Jesus. We preach about this Jesus. We talk about this Jesus, but sometimes, you know what's good for us? To stop and think back to that day. You just go back to that day when you didn't know a thing about Jesus. Go back to that day before you, right before you had this meeting with Jesus and think about your life, where you were. Think about the mud that you were stuck in. Think about the place that you were lost, the place where you were trapped. And you just stop and think for a minute. God, you pulled me out of that. God, you've made the difference in my life. But there are people today who are hurting because they don't, they don't have that. And there are some people who have experienced it, but they have, they have their minds. They just can't get that peace, that assurance that they once had. Because in their minds they're saying, there has to be more. That was too easy. That was too unexpected for it to just be by faith. And, and, and now, now my life, shouldn't I be totally different? Shouldn't there be something totally changed about me? That's what I hear the preacher talk about. And why does it look so easy for the deacons? And it looks so easy for the pastor? And it looks so easy for these people and for the missionaries? And I'm over here and I can't even get over this one little thing. How can I actually have experienced the same thing that they experienced? How can I be, have that same relationship? And we struggle. And I don't know if you're there. When you talk about the preacher that makes it look so easy, I know you ain't talking about me. <laughs> because, listen, that is where I have spent many days. Right there in that battle. Right there in that struggle. God, how could I actually be forgiven? How can I actually be there? It's a hopeless feeling. And if that's you today, I have good news. No, 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 no. I got like real good news. If that's you today, if you're here today and you say, man, I'm struggling with my past. I'm struggling with the mistakes I've made. I'm struggling with the choices, with daily temptations. I'm struggling. I have good news for you. This is news that the devil doesn't want you to know about. This, because the devil just wants you to stay right there in those questions. Wants you to stay right there in that lack of understanding, in that place of just constantly trying to get forgiveness. Constantly trying to get into a right relationship with God. Constantly struggling. Constantly fighting. The devil wants you to stay in that place. But God wants more for you. 
See, the goal, the, the good news is really about our goal in, a, in relation to God and our walk with God. What is our goal? What is our motivation? Why do we walk with God? Why do we obey God? Is it to earn a right standing with Him? And we would say no, because we know that's the right answer. <laughs> We'd say no, it's, it's not so that I, I don't do good works, I don't do good things so that I can earn a right relationship. But we live out the opposite. We live as though we must meet this standard or God is going to strike us down. We live as though the day we got saved, we became, and I understand, we became a new creation, but at the same time, it, it, it is still a working progress, right? And as we, as we look at this and we think about this, the point of the message, let me just say, is not to undermine good works. It's not to undermine Christian living. And I'm, and I'm not here to try to convince you uh, that you can live however you want and everything's going to be okay. But I want to help you live free from the legalism of having to get right with God so that you can actually enjoy being right with God. So here it is. I, I want you to understand this goal, the goal of the believer. And, I, and I've got the statement here. The goal of the believer is not to earn God's forgiveness, but rather to express our love for Jesus. Can I say that again? The goal of the believer is not to earn God's forgiveness, but to express our love for Jesus. And we see that in, in the passage that we read and the passages that we're going to read here in just a moment. But if I were to give you one thing, if I were to give you just this one thought that you could take away, an application that you can take from this message and say, okay, this is what I'm going to live out. This is what I'm going to work on this week. It's not going to be earning forgiveness. It's not going to be about trying to meet this standard or do whatever and live up to the pastor or live up to the deacon or live up to what. It's not going to be that. But if I had one thing that I'm going to walk away and I'm going to try to do this week, it's this. In every way and every day, express your love for Jesus. Express your love for Jesus. That's pretty so. I think, I think we can do that. I think we can make that happen. And so as we do that, I, I got to ask the question, what does that look like? How does it play out in our lives? What do, I mean, that's kind of a blanket statement. So how does it look in, in real life? And so I believe we see it with this woman in Luke chapter 7. We're not even given a name for her. But, but what I'd like to do is read a few verses here, kind of get the story in our minds so that we see what's happening. And then we're going to break this down and, and go straight, uh, straight from there. Uh, so in, in Luke chapter 7 and verse number 36, look with me. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. It says, and one of the Pharisees desired him that he would eat with him. Speaking of Jesus, right? That he would come and eat with him. And, and he, Jesus, went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. In other words, they sat down to have dinner together. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, so quietly to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that touches him, for she is a sinner." And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. And Jesus gives him this story. He says, There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave the most. And Jesus said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house, and thou gavest me no water for my feet. 
But she has washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman, since the time I came in, has not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which, were, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, thy sins are forgiven. And then in verse 50, what he says to her, thy faith hath saved thee, go in peace. As we look at that passage and we try to get kind of a visual of what's happening here and how is this, how is this playing out in, in this idea of expressing your love, you can see how she expressed her love for Jesus in that moment. And I believe if we were to follow that, the expression of love would start with this. We would set aside what others think so that we could set our eyes on Jesus. Think about this for a moment. This, this is going to divide the room. Some of you are going to stand on one side. Some of you are going to stand on the other. Some of you are going to be in the middle. I don't know. It may be a little bit controversial. We can provide counseling afterwards. <laughs> this could divide houses. Whole houses could, could argue about this. If you are a dog person, could you raise your hand? If, if you're a dog person, okay? All right. If you're a cat person... Could you leave right now? No, I'm just <laughs> <laughs> if, if you're okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. If you're a dog person, raise your hand. I'll be nice. Raise your hand. Okay. All right. If you're a cat person, raise your hand. There's Miss Lisa. I, I love you. The, okay. So, so we we raise our hand, cat people. Listen, um, we understand the difference in dogs and cats. We get that, right? And uh, one thing I love about a dog is that no matter what, you can leave a dog outside all day long. You let that dog in, and it's not thinking, oh, you abused me. It's not thinking, oh, you mistreated, you forgot me. It's coming to you with love. You know, if you locked me outside all day without any water and kept me out in the hot sun, I'd come in and be ready to smack you. You know, this dog, though, she's coming up, and she's licking your hand and so happy to see you. It's so grateful you're there. A cat, on the other hand, you know, the only time a cat gives you any attention is if it wants something, you know? It'll rub, its le- it'll rub up against your leg and stuff like that. that. All that means is I want some food or I want you to open the door and let me outside. You know, uh, it, it, The dog, um, Penny, my dog, they, dogs cannot help but, but show their happiness. I love that. They can't help it. They can't contain it. My dog, Penny, we, when we first got her, she was, a, she was about a year old, maybe two years old, and she was still got that puppy energy in her, and she's about 40 pounds and we, we come in, we had just gotten married, and we open the door, and, uh, and she, we're living in our new apartment, and it's, it's like pitch black in there, we're looking for the light, you know, and all, I can see just kind of the glimmer from outside, I could see through the darkness, and here comes Penny around the corner, with, running at us, head down, and all of her teeth showing. And I immediately, I realized, she don't know it's us. She doesn't know it's us. I grabbed Erica and like Superman, I threw her behind me. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> right? I threw her behind me. She doesn't realize, Penny, Penny, Penny. And Penny's still charging. And I'm going, I'm about to have to fight this dog right now. I'm going to throw her down the staircase if this goes on. And, and, and this dog is running at me. And as she gets closer, I realize her tail is wagging. She's a psycho dog. She's, she's, gonna, she's happy about about to eat whoever this person is. And she's, she's running over there like I finally get to get in another fight. And she, she's running up. Her teeth are shining. And then she drops her head and she starts rolling around with, and she's excited to see us. And she's just, she's always been that way. I, we never realized it. And we started looking up. You know, some dogs will smile at you. This dog, she's smiling at us. And every time we come in the house now, if she's real excited, them teeth, them, them gums will go up and you see all them teeth. They look a little bit nastier now than they did back then. <laughs> On the other hand, Erica used to have a cat. Erica, if you didn't know this, had a bobcat. And uh, kind of like a pixie bob is what they call it. It was like a mixture. They found it out in the woods and they should have known better at that point. But uh, they, <laughs> they brought this little baby cat in and, uh, and, and it started to grow and then it kept growing and then it kept growing and then it kept growing. And, uh, and about the time I came along, this cat had claimed territory over Erica. <laughs> and 
<laughs> and uh, Eric, he, this cat boogie, he loved Erica, right? Well, when I was in the picture now, we were dating, and I was, I'm over there, and I, I come over to the house, and this cat was always very suspicious of me. Didn't want to have much to do with me. And I, I got over there, and, and the cat, she, uh, he, 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 he was staring at me one day. I, don't, I didn't like it. He's just staring at me. And, and, and then he started getting a little closer to me. Well, maybe he's warming up to me. He's warming up to me. Okay. I'm able to pet him. And he's sitting there, and I'm sitting on the couch. And Erica had told me, you know, that's his spot. I, well, I don't care. He's a cat. He's, now that's his spot. <laughs> you know, this, this is my spot now. <laughs> and, and I'm sitting there, and the cat walks up. He's just looking up at me. And he reaches up. He props himself up on the, on the couch. And he looks over at the armrest where I'm at. And he sees my cell phone, and he slapped it, <laughs> knocked it clear off the couch. And I, I this stupid cat, and I, I, I reached down there, and I, I had to get the thing. I got off the couch, I grabbed the phone, I turned around, and he's sitting in my spot. <laughs> that was his spot at that point. I, was, I wasn't about to argue with him anymore. Uh, but, but here's the thing. You know, sometimes we're like that. Sometimes we're like that. In, in the way we express our love, we, you know, listen, God help us to be the type of people that express our love for Jesus unashamed. Penny couldn't care less what everybody thinks about her teeth. She's showing them when I walk through the door. You know, when we, when we talk about this woman, she was in a place she didn't belong. You see, she was a prostitute, but the owner of the house was a Pharisee. See, she was wretched, and he was righteous. She was lowly, he was lofty. She was used by men, and he was envied by men. But no matter what he thought of her, she would not let that keep her from coming to the one who said, Come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will rest. For your soul, you will find rest for your souls. He said, for my yoke is easy and my burden light. She never heard a story like that before. She had made up her mind. She was going to see Jesus no matter the cost. No matter what other people thought of her. No matter what the judgment would be. No matter uh, uh, what words may be thrown at her. No matter uh, what was going to go on. She wanted to be close to him. She couldn't do what she needed to do. She couldn't serve him. She couldn't be with him unless she was willing to get close. And her expression of love would start with that closeness. We worry a great deal about what other people think about us. We really do. Sometimes we're too dignified for worship. God help us. We've got to set aside what others think so that we can set our eyes on Jesus. Another thing, if we want to express our love for Jesus, we've got to minimize ourselves so that we can magnify Jesus. We see it in how she responded. She came there and certainly did not think too highly of herself, not like Simon the Pharisee did. But did you notice that with everything that was said in that whole story, she didn't say a word? We don't get her name, and she doesn't say anything. She just comes in crying. She didn't ask for mercy, and she didn't defend herself when the Pharisee spoke. What does it mean to minimize yourself? For one, you acknowledge that you, who you are and what you are apart from him. She was doing that in that moment. You see, it said that she stood at his feet weeping. Her love was an acknowledgement of the great debt of sin that had been forgiven. That's what Jesus went on to say. The reason she loves me so much is because her debt was so big. Her debt was so great that was forgiven. She's acknowledging it here. Another thing, we humble ourselves in action and deed. She began to wash his feet with tears and using her hair to clean his feet. She kissed his feet. We surrender things that we hold dear. She anointed his feet with this ointment, this perfume that was in this alabaster box. And I wish we could get, dive into all of, all of what that is, but this thing was, was a, a very valuable, would have been very valuable. And they say that really the only way, the way the alabaster box worked, it's really more like a jar. And the only way, they, they seal the perfume inside. 
And the only way you could get that out was by breaking either the bottle itself or breaking the seal. But people, uh, whether no matter how they say it was, it was opened, they all seem to agree that once you broke the seal, you couldn't reseal it. Once you broke the seal, it was broken and you had to use all of it right there in that moment. I imagine when she, it tells us that she knew that Jesus was there. That she knew Jesus was there and so she was coming to see Jesus. And I imagine at home at her house, she's in a panic. I need to go see Jesus, I need to go see Jesus. And she grabbed the most valuable thing she could grab. And she probably didn't even know what she was going to do with it. In her mind, she probably just thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give them this. You know, and we can go run it over there with like, you know, flowers that you're going to give to your wife when you, you know, mistakenly, you know, forgot her name or something like that. And, and, and you, go, you go running out there, right? And, and you just try to give her, you're trying to give them something. She's running to Jesus and she, she's just got the best thing she could find, but didn't really know what was going to happen. But she gets there in the custom of the time. And Jesus had even talked about, listen, you didn't give any water for my feet. Jesus, he's reclined at this table. The way they would sit, he's reclined and his feet are probably showing. And it says that she stood at his feet, came in, and and, in the custom of the time, they should have washed his feet. And when she ran in, the first thing she would have seen was the master in nasty feet that should have been cleaned. And the Pharisee didn't do so much as give any water, didn't give so much as a towel to clean his feet. And broken in that moment to see that Jesus, the one, the creator of the universe, was sitting here with dirty feet. And with tears, she began to cry over his feet. And then she used her own hair to wipe and clean his feet. And then in that moment, she knew, oh, that's what I can do. That instead of just giving him the perfume I can use the perfume to clean his feet she gave up something that was valuable she gave up something that meant meant a lot to her at the heart of it she took herself out of the equation and it was all about Jesus everywhere Jesus went that night I bet you could smell that perfume she made it all about Jesus. To magnify Jesus, she didn't ask him for a thing. She didn't cater to everyone else in the room. She didn't focus uh, all of her attention on these other people. She focused it all on him. She recognized what he had done, the forgiveness he had given her, and she was grateful. But here's the thing, you can, you, listen, you can minimize yourself, but not magnify Jesus. But you cannot magnify Jesus until you minimize yourself. It just doesn't work. See, Christians today, we have confused worship with music. We have confused worship with preferences. We have confused worship. See, worship is not about us. It's not about our preferences. It's not about our atmosphere. It's not about what's going on in the room. And if if, if that is what you think worship is, you're going to struggle. Because then your worship only depends on the circumstances of the room. On the song that is being played. But when you realize what worship is, that it's not about you. That it's not about you. That it's about Jesus. It's not about the person on the stage. It's not about the the people in the pews. It's about Jesus. And when you realize that, you can worship in any circumstance. Because it's all about magnifying Jesus. Minimize yourself, magnify Jesus. Uh, not, Not just here, but at home. Not just at home, but at school, at work. Not just in public, but in private. You minimize yourself. Your boss is a jerk. Okay, minimize yourself. Magnify Jesus. Fighting at home. Minimize yourself. Magnify Jesus. Your teacher's on your back about some homework. Minimize yourself. Magnify Jesus. You don't understand why life is the way that it is. Minimize yourself. Magnify Jesus. Let us echo the words of John the Baptist. He must increase, but I must decrease in every way and every day. Express your love for Jesus. Third, we examine our lives so that we can eliminate what opposes Jesus. 
See, the problem with the Pharisee was that he wasn't w- willing to take a real look at himself. And the problem with a lot of Christians today is that we are not willing to take a real look at ourselves. Amen. When we stop and we are, are, are willing to examine ourselves for the purpose of eliminating anything that opposes Jesus, we can make a difference. See, when he examined his life, he did it through broken lens. The broken lens of religious traditions. He compared himself to himself to the prostitutes, to the drunks, to the adulterers of the city. He saw himself as good with no need to eliminate anything. Even when he found himself in a controversy with Jesus. He didn't have Jesus there that night because he saw him as the Messiah. And I don't know what he did later in his life, but at this point he was still denying that Jesus was sent from God. Uh, he made nice on the outside. He, ma- he said, Master, say on. But on the inside it was, if this man knew who she was and what manner of woman she is, he wouldn't let her touch him. If this man was. The, the woman, on the other hand, she knew full well. She was repentant. She was ready to give up and, and change her life. She was ready to turn over everything And here's the thing, Jesus knew who she was, and Jesus knew what manner of woman she was, he just didn't care. He didn't care about her reputation. See, we care about her reputation. We care about the reputation of the sinner. We care about what it looks like. We care about what's going to happen if that person comes here. We care. Jesus isn't intimidated by her reputation. And the reality is, Jesus isn't intimidated by by your reputation. You got baggage, so do I. You got baggage, so did she. This is a safe place for people with baggage. This is a place where sinners should come. A place where sinners should be invited. Not a place where we should go around gathering up more saints, but a place where we should go out and gather the prostitutes. Gather the sinners. Gather the people that are going to hell. The people who don't think that they can, they can ever change. The people that see no hope whatsoever. This is the place. Because when we, when we think of it like this, we know the life change that can take place. We begin to say, you know what, God, I'll, I'll eliminate, I'll, I'll throw out anything. God, I'll throw out anything you ask just for you. Just so I can be close to you because of what you've done for me. Not because of what you might do for me. Because of what you've done. And finally, we see we come in pieces so that we can go in peace. We come in pieces so that we can go in peace. Some of you know exactly what I mean. Your life was a wreck before Jesus. Like the story I share about my dad. Freely acknowledged my life. It was, it was in shambles. It was broken. And so often we sit there and we try to piece the, the, the thing back together. We try to put it back together. We try. Our, we're doing our best. And, and, it, and it looks good sometimes. And, and then, then a piece falls out and i got to put that back. And, and, then, and then something else happens. i got to put that back. And then another chip breaks off and, oh, i got to fix this. And we try and we try and we try. But you heard a voice one day that said, I'll take those pieces. Just give me those pieces. You realize the, that was the mindset of the Pharisees. Let me fix these broken pieces. They wanted a relationship with God, so they worked real hard. They worked real hard. They wanted to be better than the rest, better than themselves. And early on, they saw their brokenness, but they had to do something about it themselves. And while they saw a masterpiece, God saw a train wreck. See, the Bible says all of our righteousness is as filthy rags. The Pharisees, they were, they, they were, their works were putrid in the eyes of God, and so are ours. Let's just be honest. Jesus said, unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter into the kingdom of heaven. What was he saying? He was saying, our righteousness, even of the best of us, does not compare. It is not enough. Paul wrote, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. 
And we know that verse. But if you read on, it says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. Through the forbearance of God. To to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. That he might be just and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Boasting and bragging are excluded. Works are void. And the only thing that mends the broken pieces of your life is faith in Jesus Christ. I promise you this, if you will take, even as a believer, if you will take your broken pieces and hand them to Jesus, he can hand you a proclamation of peace. As you leave today, I want you to consider this question, what would hinder you from accepting a gift of peace? We have forgiveness undeserved. It's waiting. It's waiting. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Savior, you have a, you have a gift of peace of forgiveness right there. And all you got to do is trust him. All you got to do is ask him. He's holding it out. And if you would just by faith receive it, you can have that forgiveness. But Christian, we live like we have not been forgiven. We live like we got to earn it instead of enjoying it. God, help us to enjoy your forgiveness and express our love. So from a place of redemption, as you remember where God saved you from, the mud, the mire that he pulled you from, would you give an expression of love towards him today? Would you let that be your mindset that dominates your week? God, how can I show my love for you this week? Yes, we have forgiveness undeserved, but let it never be said that we have a love unexpressed. Instead, let it be that in every way, every day, you express your love for Jesus.